Amazing. You're pretty awesome. Did you did you at least enjoy the extra hour that you had? Yes. How many of you did that to you know literally sleep more than you did? How many of you got up the same time you were going to Yeah. All right. I used to for sleep. I will admit that. Don't mind admitting that. We're going to take it way back in the spring. Hey, listen, we are glad that you're here, excited uh, to, to see what God is going to do in our presence today and want to welcome you. I would invite you to stand with us. The first thing that we'll do today is hear from the Lord and from His Word. And uh, this will be on the screen, and I would invite you to read it together with me from Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 7. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you. And I do not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone whose body offer prayer to you at a time you may not have. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach you. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Well, I hope that you have come in this morning uh, feeling just the, the joy of what this new life in Christ is, is like. This life that we have because Jesus has covered our iniquities. He does not count them against us anymore. Not of our faith and our trust. He's in the one who gave his life on the cross and shed his blood so that our sins might be Forgiven. How blessed indeed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sins. Are you grateful for that this morning, church? Amen. 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 Scott, would you come and lead us this morning as we sing these wonderful words of life?
Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we do thank you for these wonderful, saving, life-giving, life-transforming words of life. Oh God, we thank you that uh, it is your spirit that imparts life to us. And we thank you that your word is true. Your word is faithful. Uh, your word is uh, instructive and in showing us how we are to live in such a way that gives honor and glory to you. And so, Father, we thank you for the wonderful words of life. And thank you for the life that we have through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, we pray that your spirit would even now descend upon this place in a fresh and new and powerful way. That you would fill our hearts and our minds with the, with the wonders of Christ Jesus and, uh, and these words of life. Fresh and new today. That you might be glorified in your church. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You're welcome to be seated. At this time, we are going to share together in the Lord's Supper. And I left my little cup down there. If you did not get uh, one of these communion cups when you came in, we'd like to have one. Uh, they are in the back. Could, uh, could somebody go get that basket and just bring it in in case um, there might be others that uh, did not get a hold of a cup this morning as you came in? So this is a, a time in the, in the service where we come and and honestly, it's a time of reverence, it is a time of remembrance, it is a time uh, where we recall what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross so that our sins might be wiped out, forgiven. And uh, one, of the, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is out of uh, 1 Peter, and it's in chapter 2, it's in um, talk, talking about what Jesus has done for us, the example that he has set for us that we are to follow, and specifically, it uh, even talks about how when he suffered, he did not threaten or retaliate, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. And then verse 24, it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been Healed. Are you grateful for the healing that you have in Christ today? Yeah. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I, I know where I would be. Maybe I don't know where I'd be without the healing of Jesus. Uh, but I know it would not be here in this place. It would not be walking in his ways. It would not be walking in his truth or seeking him. He has indeed brought the spiritual healing for my soul, for which I am grateful. He himself took the sins that I have committed. And he bore them on himself on the cross. It's almost as if he uh, realized the debt. Uh, you know, if you just can imagine having a, a, a debt. Maybe some of you are in debt financially. I'm not really judging or talking about that this morning. But, but think about it. If you've got huge financial debt and you just don't know how you're going to pay it, here's what Jesus has done. He has come alongside and he has said, why don't you transfer all of that debt that you owe into my account and I will take care of it for you. And he does that. He did that for us. Not the financial debt, but the spiritual debt that we owe. Jesus, as the song says, paid in all. Our debts have been paid in full through the blood of Christ Jesus. And so on the cross, he bore our sin. He bore our guilt and our shame. And so when he died, he took it all upon himself. And he did it so that you could be free. You can be forgiven. Saved and die to sin and live to righteousness. So when we come together today, we we take the, the bread that represents his body that was broken for us, and we take the cup that represents his blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And so I want to give you just a moment this morning to bow your head in prayer. And as we come together, we, we do want to be mindful of what Christ has done. But we also want to come with hearts that are right and pure before him. And so just in these uh, few moments of silent prayer, I want to give you a chance just to uh, let the Spirit of God do some searching in your heart. Let Him reveal areas of sin in your life, that you might confess it, and that you also might find, as we read earlier, the blessedness of knowing that in Jesus, your sins have been covered.
so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh God, we praise you. We thank you for such a sacrifice. Lord, I pray that even now as we remember what you have done for us and the cost that was paid so that we can be forgiven, made righteous, have the hope of eternal life. Lord, that our hearts would be fully yielded to you, holy, true to you. And Lord, as you have maybe even shown some of us this morning areas of neglect in our life, lack of faith, sinful thoughts, attitudes, and words, and actions, Lord, that we also have the assurance in your word that if we confess our sin, you prove to be faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So help us to make that our prayer today, to confess our sins to you without holding anything back, without trying to justify or excuse or pretend or ignore, but to come clean before you who see everything anyway. To lay our lives fresh and anew at your feet for your cleansing power again. And we thank you for what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as we prepare to partake then of the Lord's Supper, uh, this is an opportunity for us to remember what he has done for us on the cross by his body, by his blood. The bread Also at the table, he took the cup. So this cup represents my blood that is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And as he inaugurated that new covenant, he calls us to be reminded of what he has done for us and how his blood is sufficient. So much like you do. That you would make a way possible for us to be saved from the wages of our sin. That we might not only be forgiven, but that we might have a new life, a new life that is infused by your righteousness, by your Holy Spirit dwelling within our hearts through faith. A life that is new and abundant and eternal. We praise you for this. Again, we are so glad that you are here this morning and grateful for those watching online as well as all who are uh, present with us today. We want to welcome some guests with us this morning as well. And, uh, we, would, uh, we, we, like, we like new people coming in and we would love to get to know you better as well. So um, we, will, we, we would love to get some information from you, uh, contact information if you are willing to, to do that so that we can follow up with you and tell you how much we appreciate you being here today. Uh, make sure we get a welcome packet to you at the end of the service. There as well. Hey, just a couple of announcements I want to make uh, sure that you are aware of. Uh, first of all, tonight the Community Gospel Sing uh, will be held at the Indian Creek Farmstead. Most of you know where that's at. If you don't, uh, you want to go out east of town here and then take a left on Curtis Road and just a couple miles up the road on your right. Um, this is a, a four 
Florida Ministerial Association sponsored event where the churches of our area all come together and we just enjoy a good night of gospel music. And uh, I think I think we have a song that you're doing as a church too, Scott. Okay, so he's uh, representing us there tonight. So uh, we look forward to that. It's at seven o'clock, but you're also invited to come early at six, and there will be a light meal offered, and everybody is welcome to come. That meal is for donation only, so don't feel obligated if you can't pay, but uh, if you can, uh, they'd be willing to receive that. Now, uh, Angie said she's going to be willing to drive the church van out there. If any of you would like to ride along, she'll be here leaving at about 545 tonight. You're welcome to hop in the van and head on that way as well. So that, uh, that's what's happening tonight. Um, Community Thanksgiving service. I won't say a whole lot about that. Just put that on the calendar. Uh, a word about to giving. Thank you for giving. You know, um, I won't take too long here, but you know, we kind of take for granted that you know we're, we're not passing the offering plate anymore. That was one of those COVID things that uh, you know we said, well, you know, we're not supposed to touch other people's stuff and have the passing around. And so we didn't, and we haven't. We still haven't done that. But uh, most of you know that we have drop boxes back at uh, near the each of the exits in the front, and, and I just want to say a word of uh, how, how deeply I am appreciative of your continued faithful giving. Uh, even through the entire pandemic, uh, God has been faithful to supply the needs of this church has had through your generosity, and, and I don't take that for granted. I, I just want to say thank you for, for your giving. Uh, many of you have you know, wrote checks out and sent them in the mail to the church. Some of you still do it that way. Some of you are giving online. Uh, giving in other ways. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you. But I especially wanted just to put that out there today because uh, last Sunday we had our uh, missionary friends here, Rick and Jill Thompson, and, and uh, we had them over at our house. And after after they got back, we were having lunch, and he said, uh, so by the way, I noticed that you all didn't take an offering. And I said, yeah. We, and he said, well, well, I had money to give, and I didn't know what to do with it. You know? so, <laughs> oh, well, so maybe I should, you know, remind people that, uh, Here's how we give, you know, right now. So anyway, in case you didn't know how you could give, I uh, just told you. So again, we appreciate uh, those who give, and thank you for, for continuing to do that. Uh, one more thing I'll say real quick, and then I'll uh, turn this over to um, Angie and, uh, and the girls. Uh, but um, many of you, and probably most of you know that Everett K. Jr. passed away last week, and um, we want to extend our condolences to Sherry and all of the family. In their loss. Uh, the services are going to be held tomorrow at uh, Grace Baptist Church in Havana. Now, Penny has also offered, uh, Penny and Rick, that if any would like to, to ride up there with them, they will take the church van from here at 10 o'clock for the service, which starts at 11. I think the invitation starts at 10, so if you want to go early for that, you're welcome there as well. But, um, anyway, I appreciate uh, that offer, so be here before 10 o'clock, the van will Well, I'm going to ask Angie to go ahead and come up with the girls. They had, um, for lack of a better word, an awesome weekend, from what I understand. <laughs> and we'd like to hear about it.
don't need to read the Bible for just information, but read it for transformation also. And I think that was really big because sometimes a lot of us, including myself, read it just to kind of check it off a list of things we have to do that day or just for the information in it. But the Bible is to transform our lives, transform our heart and our soul and our mind constantly. And I think that's something we really need to keep in mind when we read the Bible. Amen. Okay, my favorite part was when we went to our bonding breakout session because they gave us a lot of bonding time and just like to do our posters and to do what we wanted in the future because we like we did pictures out of magazines on what we wanted to do. So I thought it was really fun to like bond with the whole group and everything and the poop. <laughs> Yeah, in the hot tub.
the back the lady that came that tried to speak to us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So she gave us five truths the first night. The first one was that God is the creator and we are the creature. And the second one was we're, if you didn't hear that, we're created to look like God. The third one is that God has created us for a specific purpose. The fourth is God created us distinctly female for a reason. Amen. And the fifth one was that God has created us all uniquely. Amen.
appreciate it. Scott Tracy for uh, leading us in worship this morning. I love um, one thing that Nevaeh said is how she talked about the kids just behind her singing real loud. I, I love a, a loud singing church. Um, don't, don't, uh, don't be quiet. Even if you don't think you can sing that great, it does not matter. Just let it go, you know, let it out. And uh, even if it's a uh, squeaky, you know, off key noise, it can still be a joyful noise. And God hears that, and it's good. So, appreciate uh, it. Hey, if you have your Bible with us, with you, would you join us in looking in Matthew chapter 9 this morning? Matthew chapter 9. And I have um, cut off more than I can chew in terms of how much we're going to cover today. All right, so, <laughs> we, here, here's what we're going to do we're going to start at the end of chapter 9 and work our way backward just a little bit, but uh, I already know that I'm going to uh, make this a two-part message, all right? So that means that you have to come back next week, okay? So just making sure you know that you are obligating yourself by hearing the first part today that you have to be here again next week, all right? I just want to put that out there for you so that you know what, how, to, how to plan, how to prepare. Um, but uh, Matthew chapter 9 uh, excuse me, starting in verse 35 is where I will pick this up at. I'll read through the end of that section, and then we'll uh, kind of put some things in place together. It says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Well, let's pause there for a moment and pray. <coughs> Father, we've already been worshiping together today as we've sung these songs, as we Remember your sacrifice through the elements of the bread and the cup as we prayed together, as we heard words of testimony and encouragement from these young ladies. And Lord, we thank you that you have been present with us and that you are encouraging us uh, to stay steadfast in our walk with you, to, to motivate us to stay the course and to keep moving forward in faith. Lord, maybe, maybe for others this morning, they're already hearing a word of conviction about something happening in their life that uh, they recognize that they need to turn over to you. Or maybe it's through a song that you've already reminded someone here today that even when we go through the hard times of life and the, the difficulties, when the sun is not shining, it feels like the world is collapsing around us and we're feeling overwhelmed with the grief and the sorrow and the stuff we're dealing with. Lord, we can still praise your name. Blessed be the name. You are the God who gives and the God who takes it. You are a sovereign God who is in control of all of these things. So Lord, would you just solidify our faith and our trust in you. Lord, help us to take that next step, whatever it may be, to, to, to come to you, to put our faith in you, to do the work that you have called us to do. Lord, we're going to trust that your spirit will do work that only you can do in and through your word today. We pray for that in great power by the authority of the word of God. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So we have uh, several farmers in our midst today. And, uh, is anybody, like, do you, do you love do you love harvest time? you you got to love harvest, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. It's what you spend all summer and all year getting ready for. And, and Sarah is back there shaking her head. Oh, talking to your son. Okay. <laughs> not responding. Okay, that's good. Uh, just a minute. You know, she's not saying something. We're, we're okay. We're okay. Harvest is good. It's an exciting time. Now, I'm not a farmer, okay, so I'm not in your shoes, but, uh, man, I, I know I've just been knowing some of you guys, Kevin and Larry and Doug and others of you, you know, this, you kind of get ramped up, you get excited, it's it's the culmination of what you've spent all this this time investing in and working toward, and, and now it's here, and like, let's, let's go, let's get after it, let's do it. It's not easy. I recognize that very clearly, too. Y'all will spend crazy hours up, you know, early and, and to bed late and working hard. It's, it's not, uh, uh, 
not a job for uh, for everybody, but man, you guys need to be commended for the work you do during during harvest. Well, what we're looking at today in this passage is that Jesus is saying it is harvest time. It is it is a spiritual time of harvest. And the Lord of the harvest has come to gather the souls of men into the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for that. Grateful that the Lord of the harvest has chosen to call me into his kingdom. And it's not because of anything that I have done. It's not because of good works on my part. It's not because of any kind of a uh, spiritual or, or just a heritage, you know, even a good spiritual uh, godly parents or grandparents. None of that, none of that uh, uh, has any saving significance. It's influential, yes, but I am not saved because of what I've done or who my mom and dad are or anything else. I am saved by the grace of God. The Lord of the harvest has chosen those that he will gather into the kingdom of God. And so what we see here is that um, Jesus is going throughout all the cities and villages. Now what's he doing? He is teaching in their synagogues, he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and he's healing every disease and every affliction. I'm going, to, I'm going to come back and cover some of that uh, in just a moment, but I, I want you to know that when it's harvest time, there is a sense of urgency about the situation. And some of you har farmers, uh, you understand that there is kind of a short window in which you have to, to get the job done, to get the work accomplished. I'm going to give you some things here to know about this. Dr. Uh, Thomas Johnson was a professor I had in seminary, and I've shared this before, it's, it's been a while, maybe you remember it, maybe you don't, uh, but, but one thing that's always stuck with me from his class is that he gave us four urgencies of evangelism, four realities that make the situation of evangelism urgent, and, and that's what, uh, what Jesus is doing, he's, he's moving with a sense of urgency, he's calling us in that same way, but here's, here's these four, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. But number one, Jesus Christ is coming back quickly. This ought to remind us that there is a, a sense of urgency. There is a window of opportunity for people to respond to the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will not have forever. It will not just be an indefinite opportunity that somewhere down the line you can decide that, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that all along. No, Jesus is coming back quickly, and if he doesn't come back before we draw our last breath on this planet, then at that point it will already be too late. But the motivation that drives us to evangelism is that Jesus is coming back quickly. If you have ever read the book of Revelation, you know this to be true. In fact, the very last chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus says it three different times, Behold, I am coming soon. Take note. Behold. That is a word that ought to capture our attention. Listen to this. Take, take thought for this. And take, take heed of this truth. I am coming soon. And he will come not only soon, but suddenly. He will come like a thief in the night. You do not know at what hour your master will return. Therefore, we ought to not only be prepared ourselves, but we ought to do as a church, as the body of Christ, all that we can to do to bring people into the kingdom of God, to tell them that Jesus is coming soon, that they do need to get their lives right with the Lord. And even as John the Baptist and Jesus both came preaching the message, saying, repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Turn away from your sin. Trust in this Savior who has come right now to offer his life in exchange for yours so that you can have your sins forgiven, so that you can be made right with the Lord, so that you can be saved from the wages of sin, which is eternal death and separation from God and saved to everlasting life. Jesus Christ is coming back, and he is coming quickly. Second thing is this. The lost are really lost and headed for hell. Why, why did Jesus come if not for the fact that he needed to save lost sinners from eternal damnation, condemnation in hell? 
Jesus said uh, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Because apart from this salvation, we have no hope. No hope of eternal life. We have no peace with God. We have nothing to look forward to. Uh, we have only the, uh, the fearful expectation of the, the judgment of God and the wrath of God against us for all of eternity. The lost really are lost. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 2 for just a moment. I will get back to Matthew eventually, but uh, I want to talk just about this urgency. This urgency of what Christ has come to accomplish. The urgency of what our mission is all about. Because the harvest time is now. The window is, is short and it's shrinking with every passing day. In Ephesians chapter 2, here's what Paul writes here to the to the church in Ephesus. And you, sorry, verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. There was no life in you, no spiritual life. Yeah, you were you were a walking, breathing person. Physically, you, you had life, but spiritually, you were dead in your sins. You were following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And then he says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The lost really are lost, and they are under the wrath of God. Apart from the saving work of Jesus, we would all still be lost and, and walking uh, according to the desires of the flesh and only having the wrath of God uh, against us. Are, are you sensing the urgency of the hour? When, when it's harvest time, there is an urgency in the work that must be accomplished. I've been reading, um, starting in October, just kind of reading more deeply into the book of Psalms, and just taking one chapter a day, and not just to check out my list, you know, but to really dive into that word, not for just gaining information, but hopefully allowing, allowing the word to transform my heart and my mind, because I, and I love what we said about that. That's, that's what the word is, is, is there to do. The spirit and the word working together does a wonderful work of transforming us, heart, mind, soul, so that we learn to, uh, to despise and reject the sin and embrace and delight in righteousness, the things of, of God. But in the Psalms in particular, one thing that struck out, struck my mind and heart in a fresh way is uh, just the, the, the various ways that God says he will take care of his enemies. The Psalms had many enemies, uh, people seeking his life, and he was always on the run, it seemed like, and, and always had threats against him, plots and schemes of man, and those who thought they were something in this world, but, uh, um, but time and time again, the psalmist finds, uh, finds that God is the one who is going to deal justly with his enemies. Let me just give you an example in uh, one I was reading yesterday in Psalm 37. And look with me just here in this, this great chapter that does remind us that God will not forsake his saints. That is, that is a word that we love to be reminded of. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is going to be with us. Uh, he will preserve us as his people, as his, his chosen ones. But at the same time, you've got to understand the reality of what happens to the enemies of God. Look in verse 9, for instance. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, understand, the wicked... They will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. Talking about the judgment that's going to come against those who refuse to come to Christ for salvation. You want to keep going in this very same chapter? Look at verses 12 and 13. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. Skip down to verse 20. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They pass away. 
Verse 22, the end of that, that those cursed by him shall be cut off. Right? Are you seeing the pattern that's uh, developing there? Look at verse 28, the last part of that verse. Uh, well, let's read the whole verse. The Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. Amen to that. Thank you, Lord. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Verses 35 and 36. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I saw him, he could not be found. Verse 38. The transgressor shall altogether be destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. We have to understand this, and this is why it makes it such a an, an urgent situation. It's why Jesus came at just that right time to seek and to save the lost, because the, the time is, is limited. Well, I'm just getting ahead of myself, but, but the lost really are lost, and they are headed for a Christless eternity in hell under the wrath of God, apart from Jesus. Uh, third thing, I'm going to have to get moving here a little bit faster. The Christian is accountable for the lost whom he should reach. This one is convicted to me. I hope it is to you too. The Christian is accountable. Do you, you realize that we are all going to be standing before God? Uh, even, even believers will stand before God to be held accountable. We will not be condemned in judgment. Okay, I want you to just make, make sure we understand that. Uh, but we will be held accountable for what we have done. And we are also accountable for those whom we should reach. Um, I'm going to have to fly through this a little bit, but in Ezekiel chapter 3, also in chapter 33, you can make a note of that, mark it, go read it in full later, but, uh, but Ezekiel talks about the watchman of the wall. He's got a job to do. What's his job? To sound the alarm when the enemy is coming, to let everybody know, hey, there's an enemy on the way, you, you need to you know, get ready for battle, you need to, it, it's a call to people to be ready. Now, if that watchman fails in his job, and the enemy advances against the city and attacks it and captures and destroys the city, that watchman is held accountable for God for failing to do what he was supposed to do. Sound the alarm. Announce to the people what is coming. The Christian, likewise, is a watchman on the wall in our generation called to announce that we need to get ready for that day to prepare ourselves so that when Christ returns, we will be found faithful to him. Now, the watchman is not responsible for what the people do. They, you know, all, all he can do is tell them what they need to do, what's coming, how, how they can be prepared. He needs to warn them. Their response is on their end. We cannot save anybody by our our earnest tears, our, our words, our, our pleading with people. We, we cannot do the work of saving people, but what we are called to do is announce the word, proclaim the gospel, tell people that there is a day of judgment coming, and they need to get right with the Lord. We are accountable for the lost whom we should reach. Uh, the fourth thing, then, is time is limited and the harvest is White. And that would help lead us into back into Matthew and the gospel there as we, we looked. But we do have to understand that time is limited. Now is the day of salvation that writes to the, the church in Corinth. Now. You don't, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. How many of us know that we're going to be alive tomorrow? You can, you can make no guarantees. If something could happen this afternoon on your way home from church. Something could happen as you're uh, coming back tonight from the, the community gospel scene. We, we could get sick. We could, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff in this world that can happen. We don't know. You don't know. Don't put it off because now is the day of salvation. Now is the time that you need to turn your life to the Lord. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Time is limited. But the harvest, Jesus says, is, is white. We need to make the most of every opportunity that we have. For the sake of the gospel. We need to live in such a way that our lives shine with the good works of Christ and, and what we are called to do in such a way that it would give glory to God. We need, we need to be faithful to proclaim this word, giving the warning, yes, but, but 
also that our lives would show just the joy of what a life in, in Christ looks like. And so we are called to be faithful in the work of the harvest. Now let's come back to Matthew chapter 9. And, uh, and I'll go very quickly through this. Like I said, I'm gonna, we'll do part 2 next week anyway, so uh, that's, that's alright. So here's what Jesus did. He knew that the harvest is plentiful because he is the Lord of the harvest. And so what he does, verse 35, he, he goes throughout all the cities and villages. He went. He was on the move. This is not a time for sleeping in. It's not a time for laziness. It's not a time for indifference. It is not a time to be callous about what is happening in our world around us and in the lives of those uh, who, who we have an opportunity to interact with. Jesus was a man on the move. And we see that throughout uh, the Gospels, but uh, in particular, we, we've seen how he was willing to go to, to the hard places, to the out-of-the-way places, to the outcasts, to the, the suffering. And you can look back in chapters 8 and 9 to see uh, exactly some of those stories that are uh, taking place. Those narrative accounts where Jesus is just on the move. He's going from one city, uh, one village, to the next. Why? Because that's why he came. That's why the Son of Man came, to go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, and call men and women to repentance and follow after him. So what did he do? He went teaching, he went proclaiming, and he went healing. Now, I can't take a whole lot of time uh, to expound on each of these, but, um, but Jesus was all about uh, exposing the word of God, just opening up this word. And, and, uh, and again, I'll go back to that same thought. And say, I love what you said there. Not just to give them information about things, but to hopefully transform their lives. That they would hear this word. That these, these would be wonderful words of life to thirsty and hungry souls. That they might come to trust in them. To believe the, the words of Moses and the prophets uh, from the Old Testament scriptures. That Jesus would open up the word to them. Teaching in their synagogues. Exposing them to the truth of the word of God. He also would proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, this is a word that just means simply to announce the message. Announce this good news of the kingdom of God. That the kingdom has come and you can be in on it. This is a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of love. And that's what Jesus came to announce and proclaim to preach. And he was faithful to do that. And then he went around uh, healing every disease and every affliction in the Bible. Tells us here. Now I'm going to take just a second here to back you up, verses 18 and, uh, and following, and then we'll kind of leave it here for the rest of our time and pick it up next week. But um, let's just look at some of these accounts of Jesus' healing power. Now we've been talking a lot about the authority that Jesus had. In fact, I think Matthew in chapters 8 and 9 uh, is intended to help us understand that He is the one and the only one. Who has such authority to cleanse the leper, to open the eyes of the blind, to cast out demons, to calm the raging storm, to forgive sins. We've seen all of these uh, as examples of Jesus' authority. Um, and, and here we see that continue with, with his healing power. And it says, while he was saying these things to them, verse 18, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now, if I can just pause there for a second. You want to, you want to talk about an example of faith for a second. How many of you would have the faith to go to Jesus after the daughter has died? You know, you might think, all right, well, while she's still living, maybe she's sick. And we've seen this in other examples. Uh, there's still hope. But when the, when the book is closed and the daughter is dead, most people at that point would say, it's over. There's nothing else we can do. But not this guy. This ruler comes in. He kneels before Jesus with a, uh, a sign of respect and reverence and adoration and humility and, uh, and pleads with Jesus with this kind of faith, knowing that if he will just come and lay his hand on her, she will live again. I'm to, I am impressed by that kind of faith. I want that kind of faith. I want a faith that can not only move mountains, but a faith that could, could just put it in the hands of Jesus to do things that I would never even imagine or think would be possible. He is a God who is able 
to do the impossible. And so Jesus rose and followed him along with his disciples. Now, while he was on the way, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him. And what did she do? Again, an act of faith. She reached out and touched the hem of his garment, just the fringe of his garment, saying to herself, if only I touch his garment, I will be made well. But Jesus turned and seeing her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. He picks back up. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion as they were there in the morning and grieving over this uh, loss of his daughter's life. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand. And what happened? I'm telling you, this is the kind of authority and the healing power that Jesus has. And I don't, I don't know what all he has in store for us. I don't know what, uh, what he's intending to do among us. And maybe in your situation, you've got something that you say, I need that kind of a miracle in my life today. I, I can't promise you that he is going to bring the healing that you're looking for, but I can promise you he has authority and he has power, and there is healing in his hand. If you come to him, you will find that he is able to make a way. The report of this went throughout all the district, and it keeps going, and I'll just uh, give you these two other examples here. And Jesus passed on from there, and he's still going. Why? Because he's on a mission, because the harvest is, is now, and the time is, is limited. That window is shrinking, so he knows what he's come to do, and as he's going to blind men follow him. They're crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open. And Jesus certainly warned them, see that no one knows about this. But they went away and spread his faith through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man, who was mute, was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. The Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. I want to bring this to a conclusion this morning. Looking at this slide here again. Faith in Christ makes us well, and then moves us into the harvest field. Jesus responds to faith. He responds to the earnest, heartfelt, sincere, humble prayers of those who believe that he can do the impossible. And maybe you're believing for an impossible thing today, and it has not yet happened, but I'm telling you that it is worth waiting upon the Lord. Now, the thing may not turn out exactly like you want, okay? God is not obligated to answer all of our requests exactly like we think they ought to be answered. Sometimes, and I'm grateful for this, in God's greater wisdom than mine, He, believe it or not, may choose to not answer a prayer that I pray in the way that I pray it. And if that happens, it doesn't lead me to doubt God. It leads me to thank Him for knowing that His his plan and his purposes are going to turn out better than anything I could have imagined they would be if I had, you know, the keys and, and the hand on the wheel and could make it go like I wanted it to go. I'm going to give God the chance to do what God desires to do rather than just seeing, well, you know, didn't, God didn't answer that prayer, so I guess, you know, it's not really worth, worth praying. It's not the worth. Maybe God's not as powerful and strong as he you know, claims he is. You know, sometimes we can make Mistakes of doubt and fear and worry by such thinking. But I want to tell you again that God has the authority to bring healing. And here's the greatest kind of healing. Sometimes we get fixated on the, the temporary things. We, we want God to fix the, our health. We want God to fix this thing that we're dealing with in this situation. But the greatest work of healing that Christ came to, to do is the healing of the soul. Because we are all infected with the disease of sin. And if that is left untreated, it will lead to death. This eternal death in hell that we've been talking about. But Jesus came to bring life. 
to heal you and to, uh, in, in himself, by his wounds we are healed, the Bible says, to give you this new life. He, he longs to do that today. And it is by faith that you can be made well, right here and right now. Do you need to come to Jesus in faith today? Do you need to just throw your arms up in the air and say, Lord, I am giving everything over to you. I am, I am struggling. I am dealing with guilt. I am dealing with shame. I've got stuff in my life that I cannot escape from. I've got patterns of, of sin, maybe the addictions that I just cannot seem to break. I cannot get out of this thing. And I cannot find peace and I cannot find joy and I cannot even seem to, to live or, or move and, and and I'm telling you today that if you will just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, maybe you don't have a whole lot of faith, but I'm telling you, even a grain of faith like a mustard seed can move mountains. And if all you can do is just reach out and touch the fringe of his garment, it will be done to you according to your faith. If all you can do is like the blind man cry out, oh, God, have mercy on me. I cannot help myself. I cannot save myself. I cannot see my way forward. Cry out to him, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. And watch and see what he will do. He will have mercy on you. He will save you from your sins. He will forgive you, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what is in your background, what's in your past, what you're going through today. He has mercy on you. Oh, friend, how he loves you. Oh, how he longs to save you to rescue you from wherever it is that you are, to bring you into his kingdom, to show you his mercy and his grace, his love. You can experience that today. Faith in Christ not only makes us well, but it moves us into the harvest fields. We'll come back and talk about that more next week, not in particular, but, um, but when we when we recognize what he has done for us, do you know what it's going to do? It's going to be like this, these uh, blind men. You know, Jesus warned them, and this is not the only time we see this in the scriptures, he said, see that no one knows about this. We sometimes wonder, well, why would, why would he not want, you know, this great act of healing to be made known? Well, because it wasn't quite his time yet. You know, his hour had not yet come. And the more people started talking about him and the word gets out, uh, th this is going to be a threat to the religious leaders, as we know how the thing turned out, and ultimately it did turn out that way. And of course, they um, put him to death for that, that reason. But, um, but for now, Jesus said, "You know, let's just keep let's just keep this low." You know, um, and uh, there was going to be a time to, to speak. But but here's what they did: they could not help going out and telling what had happened to them. You know, I can I can hardly blame these guys. You know, you just can't, you know, they were blind. Once I was blind, but now I can see. How do you not go out and tell people about what Jesus has done to accomplish this new sight, this new vision in your life? And so just like that, what we do by faith is we're not only made well in Christ, but we cannot help but go out into these harvest fields. And I have, uh, I have to imagine that they probably went back to some of their friends uh, who are likewise also outcasts and struggling in various ways. They said, man, this guy, Jesus, opened my eyes, and now I'm seeing, and if you go to him, I'll bet he'll do the same thing for you. And that's what happens, and what has to happen in our lives by faith. We've got to go out into the harvest fields and tell people what he has done for us and what he can also do for those who believe. Well, we're going to have to bring this to a close for, for today. If, if, you, if you're not going to be here next week, I know we've got some guests from out of town. And, uh, of course, Zach, you're welcome any, any time. You know, it's not that far from Quincy, you know. Just a, it's, it's worth a drive over Petersburg, especially if Grandma and Grandpa are going to take you to lunch or feed you. Um, make, that, make that drive, you know. But, um, but in case you're not here next week for whatever reason, uh, here's, here's the two main points. I won't preach these, but there's, there's also not only a sense of urgency about getting the work done. There is a renewed focus in our vision as we see the hurting and helpless around us like Jesus did and had compassion on them. And then there is a passionate purpose in our prayers as Jesus instructed his disciples to pray to the Lord of the harvest that more laborers might be sent. We'll preach that next, next time. But as for now, I want you to know that it is harvest time. The Lord of the harvest has come to gather 
the souls of men into the kingdom of God. And maybe you don't know for sure today that you are one of the souls that has assurance that you will be saved on that day when Jesus returns. And I'm telling you right now, on the authority of the word of God, that you can know, you can have a, an absolute assurance that you are saved, that you belong to him, that when you die or when Jesus comes again, you will go to be with him forever. How can you know that? Maybe that's a good, it is a good question. Maybe you're asking that today. Pastor, how can you be so sure? How can I know that for sure? Well, I know it because I know that Jesus has given his life on the cross. And I know it because there is a tomb that is empty this day. And Christ has conquered death. He has defeated sin and death and hell. And he has come to rescue those who were uh, enslaved and entrapped in the domain of darkness and to bring them into the light, the kingdom of the beloved Son of God. And if he can do that for anybody, he can do it for you today. Will you come to him is the question. Will you believe? John 3.16 is a classic verse, and I'll just close with that. For God so loved the world, and you can put your name in that slot. He loves you more than you will ever, that he gave his only begotten son. So that whosoever, and that's you too, you are a whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how you can have that assurance. Not because of who you are or what you have done, what you bring to the table, but what Christ has already done for you. Will you believe? Is the question. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have come in this incredible act of love, this incredible mercy that you shower upon us. Mercies that are new every morning. The mercy that that sent Jesus to the cross so that our sins can be forgiven. That we can live before you uncondemned and made right with you. Oh God, we, we cannot do a thing for ourselves. But you have already done the work. And I pray today, Father, maybe for that one or two or a few people here in this room today or those watching online who might be struggling with some doubts or, or maybe... Maybe they would know that they have not even come to a place of trust in Jesus. And I pray, Father, that even at this very moment, your spirit would so speak this truth into their heart that they would yield their lives to you. Just saying in a simple prayer, oh God, I know that I have sinned against you. And I know I don't deserve your mercy. But I know that you love me. And I know that Jesus gave his life for me on the cross. And so I confess my sin before you and I turn away from my sin and I, and I put my trust in Jesus right now at this very moment. And I ask you to come and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Help me to live in a new way of life, a way that honors you, glorifies you, and delights in, in your way. Even as your spirit comes to dwell in my heart, help me to put the things of the flesh to death and to embrace this new life in the spirit and walk by faith. I pray with your head bowed and with your eyes closed. I wonder if anybody has prayed that prayer today. Would you just lift up your hand if that is your prayer today that you are calling out to God for salvation. Maybe there's others of you uh, here this morning who who sense something of the urgency of the hour. You know that it's harvest time, and, and there are people that you are praying for, and you've been praying for a long time. Maybe you've been praying for weeks, perhaps months, maybe years, maybe even decades, and you're still waiting for God to bring a healing of salvation to someone. Yeah. Would you make a fresh commitment today to pray for that person? And to, at the same time, say, God, Give me an opportunity to speak into the life of this person so that I can be faithful to you, so that they will hear the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you will bring salvation to them. Maybe there's somebody in the room today who knows that you're just not living in a way that would honor God. There's maybe several things happening in your life. Maybe it's 
just a whole lack of faith, maybe a, just a, a place that you've just wandered off the road and uh, you've gotten so far from God, you don't even know that there's a way back home. Friend, I want, I want to reassure you today, again, on the authority of the Word of God, that the Father in heaven is waiting for you to come home with his arms wide open, not a finger of condemnation pointed in your face and anger, but arms of love and mercy that are waiting to embrace you and to wrap you up in his grace, his grace, to restore you into a right relationship with him. And you can come to him today. You can come to him right now and say, Lord, I, I am sorry that I have wandered so far away, but I'm coming home. Father, thank you for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of your people here today. Oh God, would you glorify the name of Jesus? Would you strengthen the church that we might be witnesses into this world around us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scott, would you come and see us? I don't know how the Lord is working and what you need to do to respond today. The altar is wide open and I will be standing down here if you want to have a word of prayer this morning as well.
Michael, it's good to see you though. Too. Have, uh, have you seen you for a little while? Glad that you're here. Hey, would you